Welcome to Wright's Chapel. I'm Sue. And I'm Dave Mattingly. I've been with the church for a little over 12 years. And I've been with the church around seven years. Please check in below. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Wright's Chapel. My name is Tanya and I'm the Director of Connection Ministries. Thank you for joining us today. If you haven't already, we'd like to ask you to type in your name and the name of those worshiping with you in the comments section. This is also a great opportunity to greet one another and to say hello to those who may be new to online worship. If you're joining us at a later time or day, please visit our website, wrightschapel.org, to let us know of your attendance. If you have questions about Wright's Chapel or you'd like to learn more about its ministries, feel free to reach out to me directly at tanya at wrightschapel.org or you may call or text me at 540-604-0038. Thanks again for joining us today. Take care and have a great week. Welcome to Rice Chapel. It is so good to have you in worship uh, this day. Whenever it is you are worshiping with me, we hope that, uh, that you will draw near to God as God draws near to you. My name is Charles. I'm the pastor at the church, and uh, so good to be with you in worship this day. Uh, later in the service, we will be sharing in a time of Holy Communion, so I want to invite you to uh, get some, some juice or some bread, some wine, uh, water, uh, some crackers, maybe some bread uh, for everyone that is participating in worship with you uh, as you as you're together. Uh, we'll share in that holy sacrament later in the service. The only other announcements I have are, are, are two. One, hope that you will support, support our polar bear plunge, uh, which is this coming Saturday, February the 12th. Uh, I think the plungers are going in at noon. Uh, you can do so if you want to support somebody going in. You can do so by just going to our website 
and uh, donating to the Polar Bear Plunge Line. That goes to help our ministries of, of, of heating assistance and, and other types of emergency assistance that folks in our community need. The, the, the last announcement I have is just that we are doing uh, this, this weekly series, this worship series on the Lord's Prayer. And along with that, we are doing a class on Tuesday nights at 6.30 um, that goes along with it. It's an hour long, 6.30 to 7.30, Tuesday evenings. Uh, you can join us in person in our fellowship hall, or if you want, you can uh, get the link to that um, and do that on Zoom. And, and uh, if you just comment in the section that you would want that link, Tanya would be happy to send you that link for that Zoom class on Tuesday evenings, uh, 6.30, 7.30. So good to be with you. If you, have, uh, if you have prayer requests, as we move into a time of prayer, if you have prayer requests that you would want to share, uh, we we'll hope that you'll do that. You can comment that in the comment section. Uh, uh, if you haven't checked in yet, please do so. Check in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. If, if you see someone you know or someone you know, please welcome them uh, to worship this morning as well. Again, thank you for taking time to worship our God this, this, this day. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings that you pour down upon us each and every day. You desire to fill us with good things, to share your abundant life with us, and to pour out your Spirit upon us. You lavishly grace us with your mercy and forgiveness. Your resurrection power is available to us always, and your scriptures proclaim your message of love and healing. Despite all the ways you reach out to us, we often turn aside. We are busy. We are distracted. We are unwilling to give up lordship of our lives. When we inevitably reap what we have sown, we have the audacity to complain and point the finger of blame. Yet all the while, you never stop inviting us to listen to your voice and to be restored in your loving embrace. Thank you for your patience and for your love, which is everlasting. We pray this day for your power and presence to be with us and with those who are most in need. Bring healing to the sick, comfort to those who are afraid, hope to those who are in despair. Help us to be instruments of your healing and hope where we are able. We ask these and all things in the Jesus who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, my name is Grayson Kelly. Join me in the reading of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hi, my name is Sarah. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our king, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread, and we forgive our debates as we also forgive our debaters. For if you forgive others others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive either, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hello, my name is Liam. Two others were criminals. They led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus with 
the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Fishermen for James and for John They came with me and the dance went on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance said he I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame The holy people said it was a shame Whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and they left me there on a cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday and the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back They buried my body and they thought I'm gone But I am the dance and I still go on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance and he And I lead you all wherever you may be And I lead you all in the dance and he They cut me down and I left said he dance then wherever you may be i am the lord of the dance said he and i'll lead you all wherever you may be and i'll lead you all in the dance and he i want to thank all of our our people who have helped in leading our worship this morning let us pray then together oh lord break the bread of life That in so doing, we may be better able to hear, better able to understand, and thus better able to respond. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've been worshiping with us for any amount of time online, then, then you will have noticed that we often have our children and our youth participate in leading worship. Sometimes our young people help with the opening to worship. Uh, uh, one of them might read a prayer, uh, lead us in the Apostles' Creed, maybe read a scripture lesson for us. And uh, we, we are intentional, intentional about that. We want to have our children and our youth participate in, in worship for a variety of reasons. Um, first, our, our young people, um, quite frankly, are most often the most willing to be on camera. <laughs> I'm not sure why the older we get, the more camera shy we get, but that, but that seems to be the case. <laughs> Secondly, we want all of our church family um, to participate in, in, in worship and to, help, and to help lead us. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly, um, we think that for many of our young people, their faith is shaped by doing. And so by reading the scriptures aloud or leading us in the Apostles' Creed, That is a way for them to also learn the lessons of our faith. And we know that sometimes they mispronounce or they stumble over words and sometimes they read really, really fast or maybe they read slower than you might. But those experiences of participating and saying and reading the words make a difference in their life of faith over time. 
A few weeks ago, um, I asked on, on Facebook where, where you learn to say the Lord's Prayer. And the, the, the largest majority of those who responded said it was from sitting in worship when you were a child with your parents. That, that's how I learned the Lord's Prayer, too. Uh, Sunday after Sunday, as a, as a kid, sitting in the hard pews of the United Ministry of Delhi in upstate New York. My, my sister Beth and I, we'd say the Lord's Prayer, and then, and then quite frankly, we'd probably start playing tic-tac-toe with a little, little pencil that was in the pew, playing on the edge of the, of the bulletin, hoping, praying that the sermon would be, her, that the sermon would be short. <laughs> I'd be curious. I'd be curious. Those of you who remember growing up in there, what, what did you do when you were a kid in church to, to make the time go by faster? What games did you play? Go, go ahead if you want and comment in the comment section what you did when you were a kid. But the reality today in the U.S. is that a lot of younger people are not sitting in worship with their parents anymore. And that is mostly because parents are not sitting in worship either. And that's not just a a Rites Chapel phenomenon. That is all across all faith traditions in the United States. As fewer and fewer young people are engaging with churches for worship. Our our children's ministry and and youth ministry here at Rites Chapel, where where we serve probably 60 to 70 kids each week, the vast majority of those kids who participate during the week are not attending worship anywhere with their parents over the weekend. And and so what we've learned is to use the days, to use the time we have with our young people to help pass along the traditions of faith that give us a solid footing, that give us a grounding on which to to stand. Uh, We we recently sent out out these books um, to our online worship families uh, who have children hoping uh, to give them another way to teach their children the words to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, The book is entitled, The Most Important Prayer of All, All. Stella Learns the Lord's Prayer. It's the story of of, of grandparents teaching their granddaughter the Lord's Prayer. And and I would just say, if you haven't received one, or or you would like one for for your child, or or maybe for your grandchild, um, you can can go ahead and you can message us in the comment section and and Tanya, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to try and get one, get one to you. But we all know, don't we, that sometimes even with our best intentions, the, the words that we intend to teach our children, those words can get turned around in their heads, don't they? And, and that happens with the Lord's Prayer as well. A, a, little, a, a little three-year-old named Reese um, ended up praying the Lord's Prayer this way. He said, Our Father, who does art in heaven, Harold is his name. <laughs> A four-year-old play prayed, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. And, and one woman wrote um, that she had been teaching her three-year-old daughter, Caitlin, the Lord's Prayer. And, and for several evenings at bedtime, she would just have Caitlin repeat it line by line. And when finally mom thought Caitlin could do it on her, on her own, the little girl prayed, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us some email. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, and, I, and I realize that, that makes us chuckle, um, but sometimes we adults who, who pray the Lord's Prayer just like these children, we too may not fully grasp all that Jesus was trying to teach us in giving us this prayer. And, and so we are now in, in our fourth week examining the words that many of us uh, speak so freely and fluently in, in worship e- each week. Three weeks ago, we looked closely at that first line, our Father who art in heaven. And, 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 and granted, our God probably does do art in heaven, but that's not what we're saying. Um, the, the, the second week, we honed in on thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And last week, we took a, look, a, a closer look at, at the daily bread that we're asking for. And, and today, we're going to focus um, on that next line in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, though, let me answer a question that I have been asked numerous, numerous times. Why... Why do different churches use different words in the Lord's Prayer for what we are asking forgiveness for? I mean, if you were raised in the Methodist or in the Catholic Church, you grew up asking for forgiveness 
from trespasses. Uh, But then at some point, if you found yourself worshiping in a Presbyterian church and it came time for the Lord's Prayer to be spoken, you know what it is to have everyone looking at you because you were praying, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And all the Presbyterians around you were praying, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, can I tell you, Presbyterians and other traditions don't use the words debts simply so that they can know when a Methodist is in the house. Um, Some churches say debts, other churches say trespasses. Growing up, my church um, said, forgive us our sins. And and the reason we use different words is because the gospel writer, Matthew and, and Luke, the two writers that record the Lord's Prayer, they wrote this prayer in Greek. They wrote in Greek, not in the Aramaic that Jesus spoke. And Matthew tells us uh, that Jesus said to pray this. Matthew says, uh, Jesus told him to say, forgive us our debts. But then as a follow-up to his prayer, Matthew says, Jesus goes on to say, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Father will also forgive you. Luke tells us that Jesus said to pray, forgive us our sins. And so there you have it. The Greek word for debt, for sins, for trespasses are all used in conveying this prayer. And, and quite frankly, these words are in some ways very synonymous, but, but, it's, but it's interesting to see the subtle nuances um, and the differences between them. In Jesus' day, as in ours, pretty much everyone understood a metaphor about debts. Just as in our day, in the time of Jesus, most common people owed someone something at some point during the year. The the tenant farmers were living on leased land, and they may have borrowed money for for seeds. At at the harvest, they owed a portion of the crop to the landlord or the lenders. Of course, without regular paychecks and with droughts and taxes and other obligations, it was not uncommon for working people to owe something to someone multiple times a year. Now in Jesus' day, there was was no declaring bankruptcy and and getting a do-over. When someone got so far in debt that they could not repay, mercy might be shown for a time, but ultimately there were two fates in the Greco-Roman world. Either you became a slave until you worked off your debt, or you were imprisoned in debtor's prison until someone paid off your debts. And and when someone paid off your debt and set you free, that person was said to have redeemed you. And so they were known as the redeemer. This is one of the words that the New New Testament authors use to describe Jesus. And, and, And we have a song that we sing, My Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. Interestingly enough, in the ancient world, it was also a common practice when someone's debts were finally paid off, that the creditor, the the person who was owed the money, would strike a nail through the certificate of debt. In the same way, when Christ died on the cross, a nail was driven right through the debt of our sin. There there are no longer any outstanding charges against us. Jesus has redeemed us from debtor's prison by giving his life for ours. Forgive us our debts, Lord. Luke, though, when when he's teaching his disciples to say this prayer, uses uses the Greek word for sin. Forgive us our sins. Haramatia. Harmatia is a familiar uh, term in the Greek for archery. It means to miss the mark. And the idea is that there is this mark, a bullseye, right, that we are trying to hit. And the bullseye is, of course, doing God's will, loving God, loving our neighbor, doing justice, showing compassion. And sometimes we hit the mark, right? Sometimes we hit it when, when we feed the hungry, when we lift up the oppressed, when we do the loving thing. But at other times in life, we are like the arrow that, veers off to the, to the right or veers to the left or falls short of the target. We often miss the target that God has set. And so we pray, forgive us our sins, Lord. And then, of course, in the 14th and 15th verse of this sixth chapter that were read for us today, um, Jesus gives a little commentary in Matthew's gospel on, on, just this, on just this one line of the prayer. 
And Jesus says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So, so what is a trespass? Well, the, well, the Greek word for trespass literally means a falling away. It means a misstep, often unintentional. It, it could mean someone who took a wrong turn. I think, I think of no trespassing signs, right? When we trespass, we step on or we infringe upon what is not rightly ours. It, it's a turning away or a falling away from a right relationship. We often turn away or fall away from each other and from God. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord. And so in, in, in my relationship with God and with others, I, I have incurred debts. I have, I have missed the mark. I have trespassed. I have made missteps. I've fallen away. And so have you. But here's the deal. <laughs> we as Christians often find ourselves in one of two scenarios. Oftentimes, we become blind to our own shortcomings. And we, and we fall into the trap of rationalizing our behaviors and our thoughts, and we, we start thinking, well, I'm a good person. I, I don't do a lot of bad things. I, I try to be good. And then this is where we often go, right? We, we, we get in our head and we say, well, well, I'm certainly not as bad as. I'm not as bad as. And right now, you're thinking of that person. And you've got a picture of them in your mind. And you can name that person that you're not as bad as, can't you? Now, I'm telling you, don't name any names. And for goodness sakes, don't point. Don't point at anybody in the room, for sure. But we need to remember that Jesus didn't instruct his disciples to pray, Father, keep us from being as bad as Joe. <laughs> didn't tell us to pray, to say, I mess up sometimes, God, but I'm nothing like Sue, nothing like Thelma. God, you probably need to spend more time with them. <laughs> no, Jesus said when we pray, say, forgive us our trespasses. And so sometimes we, we fail to recognize our own need for forgiveness. And, and, and we, can, we can certainly see the need that others have for forgiveness, but sometimes we struggle to see our own, our own need. There's a story that, that Jesus told about a prodigal child who, who took his father's money and squandered that money in a far-off country and and, and everybody who was looking in from the outside and saw the situation knew that the boy had trespassed, uh, uh, sinned, was, was indebted to his father, and that the boy was in need of forgiveness. Everybody knew it. Everybody, that is, except the boy. The boy didn't care about forgiveness. He was out spending his father's money, money that he thought was rightly his. Until Jesus says, the boy in a faraway country he came to himself. It was when the boy came to himself that he realized his own need to be forgiven and to be reconciled to his father. And, and only after he came to himself did he start that long journey home. Now the father, we know from the story, had already forgiven his child long ago. But it was only when the child came to himself that they could be truly reconciled. And so how do we, we who tend to fall into the trap of comparing ourselves to the worst person we can think of, how do we come to ourselves and begin to recognize our own need for forgiveness? And one way is through this wonderful prayer. Because each time we pray these words of the Lord's Prayer, we are meant to remind ourselves of our need for forgiveness. Jesus said, when you pray, whenever you pray, pray like this. This is not a prayer that we pray once a year. This is not a prayer we pray once a month. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Forgive us our trespasses. Now, now the other scenario that some face as Christians is that you struggle on the other end of the spectrum and you feel guilty all the time. <laughs> and you've come to believe that you are the sole reason the world is in the mess it is. Somehow in your mind, you've managed to screw up everything you've ever been a part of. You've never done anything right. And you can't imagine that anyone, especially God, could or would forgive you of your sin. Your sins are too many. Your sins are too big. And, and there aren't, if you're Catholic, there aren't enough our fathers that you could say that would do penance enough for your life. You'd still feel guilty. Here are the, here are the two things that I get out of this phrase that Jesus taught us to say. When it comes to forgiveness, we need it, and God is willing to dispense it. 
And, and here's what Jesus tells us to do to rectify our relationship with God. We ask for forgiveness. We ask God to release us from the debt we owe from our past sin. We ask God to release us from the time that we've missed the mark. We ask God to set aside the times we've trespassed or fallen off in our relationship. And throughout the gospel, Jesus teaches us about the generosity and the grace of God who is willing to forgive. And, and quite frankly, friends, we live into that grace even today as we accept God's invitation to come to God's table and dine. And we hear God say, you are forgiven. Here, my friend, eat this bread, drink this wine, and remember that I love you and I forgive you. You are my child. Welcome home. Now, the easy part of this prayer is the first half. But things can get really tough with the second half. Uh, for it is not only in my relationship with God that we've missed the mark, but, it, but it's in our relationship with others too, isn't it? We've hurt others. Others have hurt us. Sometimes in really horrific ways. And yet what Jesus is teaching us is to pray in such a way that whenever we ask God to forgive us, that we challenge ourselves to do the same for others. We are challenged to forgive others the way God has forgiven us. And oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, that can be so very, very hard to do. And anyone who's ever been in any type of long-term relationship knows that forgiveness has to be a part of that relationship. Thankfully, uh, thankfully my wife Amy is pretty good when it comes to forgiveness. And oh, she, she hadn't forgotten things. She hadn't forgotten the things I've done that were wrong and insensitive and, and annoying but she's forgiven me for at least most of them on the other hand can I just say that my wife is so wonderful I can't think of anything Amy has ever done to me that I've needed to forgive her for that will make my life much better this afternoon and yet how much pain we face in our marriage, in our close relationships with our kids, with our co-workers, how much of the world's pain is a result of our unwillingness to forgive, of our harboring of resentment, our need to get even. And Jesus, what he's trying to do is offer a better way. It's called grace. It's called mercy. And mercy doesn't say that the wrong done to us or by us was okay. Mercy doesn't even eliminate all the consequences for the wrongdoer. But, but mercy does let go of my right for retribution. Mercy is, is the start of my letting go of anger and bitterness towards you, my, my holding something against you. And truthfully, forgiveness is a gift. It's a favor we do for ourselves in order to free ourselves. For I'm telling you, when we hold on to bitterness and resentment, we continue to rehash the wrongs that are done to us. We can, we can make ourselves sick. But when we're able to let go of the anger and the bitterness, at least we start to set ourselves free. Now, forgiveness is not easy. And when the hurt is deep and a betrayal of trust has been broken... It is never, it is never as simple as saying, well, let me sleep on it and things will be better in the morning. Forgiveness is, is more like a process. And like the grieving process, it can look different for everyone. And it can't be rushed through. And can I tell you, for some, working through forgiveness, it takes professional counseling and it takes guidance to help move the process of forgiveness along. Two, two, of the, two of the first people I met when I came to serve as the Minister of Rights Chapel 30 years ago um, were Frank and, and Marie Wilson. And, and, and some of folks here may, may still remember them. Frank, Frank served as our choir director for a bunch of years, and, and, he, and he died a number of years ago now. And, and, and several years ago, uh, Marie, uh, she moved in with family to be cared for, and, and Marie um, is still living in Florida near her daughter, uh, Frank, into her 90s now. Frank and Marie were both retired school teachers from the Washington, D.C. area when they moved into Lake Caroline. Frank and Marie came to, to Wright's Chapel during a real struggle in their life. Uh, shortly before they retired, their oldest 
son Wayne had gotten married and he and his new bride were on their honeymoon in the Caribbean. And one evening when they were out enjoying the beauty of the island, they were mugged at gunpoint. And tragically, Wayne was shot and killed. Obviously, everyone was, was just devastated. Marie and Frank crushed at the murder of their oldest child. The young man who shot their child was arrested, was tried, convicted. But the pain for the family, as you might imagine, was, it was still overwhelming. The pain and the heartache and the anger were the reason why Frank and Marie started coming to Wright's Chapel. Looking for a way to cope with their loss, to cope with their anger, with their bitterness, hoping to find comfort, to find something in God to help them live again. I can remember talking to Marie, who finally came to the place where she was able to say, I forgave the young man who shot my son. And it didn't happen overnight. And it didn't happen in the first months either. Rather, if I remember, it was several years. And what Marie told me is that she began to think of the mother of the young man who shot her son. And, and Marie said to me, she said, that, that mother lost her son too. And I imagined that she loved her son the way I loved mine. And that began to change the way I thought about him. I'll never forget the pain, Marie said. But I don't want harm to come to that man or his family. I've forgiven him. I'll tell you, I don't, I don't know if Frank ever got there. I don't know. I know he struggled with forgiveness. And he struggled with the pain. And I believe, and I believe that God was with him in that in that struggle. And, and so one of my hopes, one of my hopes is that neither I nor any of you would ever have to face the prospect of offering forgiveness over such a hurtful, painful experience because I'm telling you, I can't imagine the pain. But as a pastor, I also know this, that life can be tough. And I know that life for many, is filled with pain, is filled with heartbreak, is filled with despair. And so part of what we do each week in worship is we till the soil and we begin to pr prepare our hearts and we prepare our lives for those times when we are called on to offer forgiveness to another as God has forgiven us. I do believe, I do believe that that's what Jesus did. And I imagine that it was only because Jesus had tilled the forgiving soil of his heart by praying, forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. I believe it was only because he had prayed that, that Jesus was able to utter his prayer from the cross and actually show us what it looks like. Father, forgive them, Jesus said, for they know not what they do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Peace and amen.
Again, I just say thank you for the gifts you give to the life of our church that just allow us to do uh, so much, so much ministry. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do because of the gifts you give is to send out these books, to send out worship uh, boxes to, to many of the folks who are worshiping online, to send these to our kids um, in order that, that they might learn the words of the Lord's Prayer. And, and, uh, and these, these aren't expensive, but, but they add up. And, uh, and so we thank you. We thank you for the gifts you give, that you text in, that you mail in, that you give online, that just allow us to kind of reach out and to share ministry and to share our faith um, with, with all sorts of, of folks. I want to invite you now, if you haven't already, to get um, your elements for communion. Bread uh, or crackers, uh, wine, juice, water, and let us prepare to celebrate this holy sacrament. And so we remember the night that Jesus gave himself up for us. And he took the bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. With your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. And so I would invite you to take your bread, your crackers, to share that with one another. And as you do, to say to one another, uh, the body of Christ given to you. And then you can pass the cup, and I invite you to share with one another, saying, the blood of Christ shed for you. And as we partake, we remember this meal, this meal of forgiveness, this meal of, this meal of welcome, this meal that, that Jesus says, you are my children, and I have forgiven you, and I welcome you at my table. Let us take and eat together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this holy meal that you share with us. It is a meal that fills not our stomachs, but our hearts and our souls. May we be filled with your grace and your mercy, that we may be those who are able to share that grace and mercy with others in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let me share with you this benediction, and then Clay will lead us into a final song of praise that we might go forth into this world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good and render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint, harden and support the weak, help the afflicted. Honor every person, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the powers of the Holy Spirit. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>
the praises of the King.